Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Driving Clinical Quality and Outcomes with a Robust Clinical Data Framework. Before we get started, I'd like to announce a few brief housekeeping details. Today's session is being recorded and an online archive of today's event will be available a few days after the call upon review and approval by the sponsor. I'd like to remind you of AHIP's uh, antitrust statement and ask that you reference it in the handouts tab. The antitrust statement prohibits us from discussing competitively sensitive information. You may ask a question at any time during the presentation by typing your question into the Q&A box located on the right side of your screen and pressing enter. If you have any trouble seeing the slides at any time during the presentation, please press F5 to refresh your screen. We are very fortunate to have with us today Jeffrey Springer and Swanon Prabhut and Dolkar. And Jeff leads the product management and business analysis team at Sidious Tech. Over the past 15 years, he has worked with leading healthcare technology vendors, including Siemens, MedCisions, uh, McKesson, and Care Science. He also founded the first payer provider contract management company in the country, eHealth Contracts. Swanon is the leader of the Sidious Tech Healthcare Interoperability BIDW Big Data Practices. With more than 18 years' experience in information technology with, with companies such as Epic, Polaris, and 3i Infotech, Swanon has strong ex experience in regulatory reporting requirements such as MU and healthcare standards and frameworks, including HL7. At this time, I would like to turn the floor over to your first speaker, Jeff. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Kelly. And this is Jeff Springer, just so you can recognize our voices. Um, today, we're going to be going through a variety of topics. Um, so our webinar objectives today are to discuss healthcare industry trends, the importance of using this data to turn it into action, because really the data is all about improvement to some extent. And then what are the best practices in uh, clinical data integration? So uh, a little business, a little functional, a little technical, what we're going to cover today. From a uh, healthcare trends perspective, clearly everybody knows uh, the market's shifting to value-based care. And as we see that, the bonus structures, the payment structures uh, are shifting for both payers and providers. And this is affecting the payer community with shifting business models, uh, especially with large bonus payments tied to things like Medicare Advantage, um, other programs, pay for performance, contractual programs, um, and then uh, working with the providers on their programs. As we look at this, the taking this data and figuring out how to improve is one of the key things. So what's the integration, uh, the communication internally within a payer organization, but then payer to provider, payer to member, and that's going to require a number of different data sources, maybe that weren't available yesterday as you uh, continue your journey. And then what are the best practices in clinical integra integration? This is a big lift. And how do you uh, take one bite at a time uh, out of the apple? So we're going to go through all of these things. We're going to start uh, with some of the industry trends uh, in terms of what's going on. Now, why do payers need uh, clinical data integration. So value-based care, and this is, uh, I think, speaking to the choir here with the folks who are on the on the phone. Uh, clearly, uh, things are going more and more at risk. Uh, payers have historically always driven value-based care, but providers are now participating. Providers are executing, and providers need the information in order to execute. Payers' budgets are much larger than uh, provider budgets, so the coordination the communication, the understanding of the data between these different organizations is critical uh, in order to execute on that. So where are the gaps? How do you ensure accessibility to that information uh, for somebody, whether it's groups within the payer organization or the provider, even the member, to do something about it? Achieving objectives for pay for performance programs. So uh, what is the reimbursement of those? How do you drive those? I always think that the incentive patterns 
and the money follows the behavior patterns or the behavior follows the money patterns. So with the shift to Medicare Advantage and large bonus payments around that, what we're seeing was programs that used to be one-off programs like HEDIS, STARS, care management programs, pay for performance programs are now all becoming strategic programs rather than uh, programs where you deliver them in the back room. How do you bring those things together? How do you communicate as one organization around this, coordinate and maintain a patient-centered uh, focus to drive that improvement? And so we're gonna look at all of these things. Um, just one uh, quick story in terms of some of the customers we've seen when we went to talk to our customers as we were starting implementations of them, we saw that they were reaching out to providers from five, six, seven different groups. So I've got a HEDIS group, I've got a STARS group, I've got a provider relations group, I've got a care management group, I've got a member relations group, I've got a claims group, all of them needing this data, reaching out to providers on this data, creating provider abrasion, having different sources of the data for them. So these are all things where an organization needs to bring them together into a single initiative so you can speak as one voice. And it's not just bringing the data together, it's bringing the coordination communication together. So not just from an industry perspective, but from a regulatory perspective, things are changing and you have to keep up and adapt. So CMS uh, has recently uh, proposed uh, interoperability rules. Why are they doing this? They want to make this data available to folks outside the four walls of the payers organizations requiring uh, fire-based uh, specifications for exchange uh, and use of that data. And so it's clear what CMS as a regulatory body wants to do. They want to drive coordination and share data. As we said before, payers have more resources than providers, a broader set of data, maybe not as deep as providers, but a broader set of data. How do the providers leverage that? These fire interfaces are a step towards that. Um, in addition, uh, the My, uh, My Healthy data is trying to give patients more control over their data, more visibility into their data. In addition to changing the standards of how we exchange data, some of the standards of the data itself is changing. So. Um, uh, EDI X12 is going to be changing standards uh, with its next major release to 7030. Uh, this is going to be a fairly large change in the formats of the data. Um, we've seen this over time uh, for different types of data, whether it's the EDI feeds or things like CCDA uh, becoming going from CDA to CCDA, uh, HL7 versions changing, uh, direct feeds changing. And then NCQA is changing the way uh, they process measures, so ECDS measures are new. They're trying to follow the patterns uh, from ONC CMS of doing electronic measures, uh, following the patterns of that uh, with machine-readable uh, measures in a programming language called CQL, um, but then also the type of data they'll certify as standard. So uh, moving some of the data that was previously standardized or standard supplemental data i.e. a CCDA to making it non-standard supplemental unless you run it through a certified system. And so adding requirements on what is the data management of that, what is the data flow of that. Um, so in addition to trying to bring the data together for different programs, value-based, care management, contractual, now you have regulatory requirements that are overlaying that in terms of uh, people's ability to access that data, how that data is processed, the formats of those data are all changing at the same time. So what are some of the key use cases? What are we thinking about? So cost reduction. Cost reduction from two perspectives. One is the efficiency of staff. So bringing together one, two, 70 different sources of data is expensive from a technical perspective, but cost reduction also from a clinical perspective. Both of these costs are very important as you create your strategy. Clearly, you can't uh, integrate everything uh, in an efficient way. So how do you do it in the right order to make sure you're pulling together that data? Stakeholder engagement. So as I uh, talked about before, uh, payers often have siloed organizations in terms of how the communication is going out to external entities, uh, provider abrasion, member abrasion, uh, can be caused by multiple outreach, multiple campaigns. How do you coordinate those? How do you communicate those? 
the care coordination uh, between entities. Often the payer is the, uh, the only one that knows uh, that care has happened in one setting and should be happening in another setting. How do you help uh, providers to exchange data, to exchange information so the right care happens at the right uh, points in time? Revenue maximization. So uh, with programs like uh, the STAR program, Medicare Advantage, um, huge bonus payments tied to this. Often uh, these programs uh, have to uh, have good provider engagement, but how do you do that in a PPO world where you don't control the provider or uh, for networks where uh, you're a small percentage of the uh, provider's practice? Uh, and then performance management. Um, this one uh, to me is fun. So healthcare often gets compared to other industries, and uh, I, I don't often like the comparison, but one of the comparisons that I'll use is when I got my first paycheck, uh, I uh, got handed my paycheck from somebody walking around the office handing out paychecks. I then ran across the street to my bank, stood in line at the tellers. Uh, 45 minutes later, I had deposited my first paycheck. I was very excited. I can't tell you the last time that I actually saw cash or a paycheck. Uh, if I do get a check, I'm taking a picture of it with an app and depositing it. Um, healthcare from a performance management perspective is still running across the street and waiting in line with the teller. There's a lot of technologies, a lot of innovations out there that we can drive performance management to go to concepts like direct deposit, like taking pictures with checks. Um, and as an industry, we can take big leaps forward. So with this, I'll turn it over to Swarn. He'll talk about conceptually uh, the schematic uh, that we're driving to, and then we'll get into uh, some detail around the uh, pieces of that schematic, and then how do we implement them. So Swarn, and over to you. Yeah, thanks, Jeff, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, the way to look at this, uh, this slide is uh, bottom-up. Uh, of course, the arrows are pointing there. Uh, the, the way we have imagined this is there are three three big uh, aspects that uh, they, any 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 data uh, ingestion strategy has to has to deal with. The first one is uh, data data access strategy. Uh, you have got multiple sources which are sending you data, maybe health information exchange, the labs, medical groups, hospitals, and whatnot. Uh, you need to have a data strategy to get data from external sources as well as you will have your own internal sources too, and you need to have a uh, you know, single single strategy to to get data from all of them. The next one is once you have the data, uh, you know, be it standard data, maybe HL7, next FHR of the world, or it could be custom. You know, maybe somebody sending you a custom CSV or somebody sending you a custom XML, whatever it is. Uh, once when you have you know solve the problem data access, the next one is the data acquisition. You pass it. Uh, store it in in a in a in a place where you you are able to store your source data that you have received, uh, and as well as you know your parse data because the parse data is the one uh, which you are going to then further process, and uh, that's where what's going to happen is uh, you need to worry about a lot of other items that is you know you need to look look at uh, data curation in terms of. Uh, Working on data quality uh, is is the is the data that I'm receiving is of the right quality yes or no? Uh, do, what sort of a transformation do we needs I have? And my transformation needs are driven by mostly my you know downstream systems. So am I am I sending my data to my ADS engine? Am I sending data to uh, maybe care management systems? Probably both of them need something else. And uh, how my uh, transformation engine is going to look like. Uh, do I have to form uh, a single source of truth across the data that is coming from hospitals and labs? Uh, uh, which which source do I give more preference? Uh, do I give uh, data coming from hospital more preference uh, in terms of demographics and probably for lab values? Of course, it is lab. Uh, can I can I be able to you know form such kind of uh, thumping logic? And all of this uh, has to be maintained. So that's that's the second pass that we look at. And the last one is data delivery, wherein you know you you expose the data to external uh, world. Uh, having said that, uh, and as Jeff uh, mentioned some time back about the new regulations that are there, uh, one more uh, you know one more care one needs to take nowadays is uh, 
create the standard supplemental data from non uh, you know sub standard supplemental data so uh, if you are receiving ccdas earlier they were more more of you know called as a standard supplemental ones uh, but nowadays uh, there is going to be a certification as well uh, as you would receive ccdas you are uh, you know required to consume ccdas and then convert those ccdas to a standard supplemental data and then feed it back into your system and then you know make it available for your health engine or maybe your clinical analytics engine uh this is the way we are thinking about it uh, there are there will going to be three three uh, you know broad level uh, layers and various components which will be acting on the data and you know taking your data from the from the files that you have received from various sources uh, to a common uh, data model uh, which can be then exposed to your downstream systems uh, by using views or maybe uh, you know by using apis which could be like uh, fhr apis uh, you know going going further in the field so having said that uh, i think that that's all i had on this slide jeff over to you so as we uh, go through this we're going to do polls and um, want to get the audience involved uh, with some of the polling uh, questions that we have uh, here. So our first polling question is, do you have a single source of clinical data for multiple purposes? So whether it's HEDIS, risk, contractual obligations, contract management, operations, claims, so on and so forth, what we'll do is we'll allow everyone uh, to answer this question. Uh, we'll go on to one slide and then we'll come back uh, to see the results of, of the question. And it should be appearing on your screen at this time. This one, I'm back over to you. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about the challenges uh, you know, that 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 are there for uh, any clinical data integration strategy, per se, uh, are, are just too many. Uh, you you can read for yourself, but uh, you know things like data access. Uh, there are multiple sources, and most of our customers that we have seen correctly receive data from multiple disparate sources, and in different formats too. So some sources do send healthcare standards, as I said earlier, and some of them would send custom fields like CSVs or you know maybe custom XML or so. Uh, one of our customers receives data uh, in a, in a continuous streaming fashion. And uh, but their data curation requirement is more of a batch kind of a need. So they keep receiving data over a period of day, every day, uh, every every hour, every minute. They keep receiving data in a continuous stream. Uh, but what uh, the, their their data processing, their curation, their uh, quality processing, all those logics are built on on top of more of a batch processing. So we keep accumulating data over the day, and then at the end of the day, you need to process it uh, for your batch processing. Uh, on the on the on the curation and provisioning side, correct. So there are again multiple ways uh, wherein the challenge is supposed. Uh, first, first and foremost challenge that we have seen uh, all of our customers facing is the is the quality of data. Uh, whether the quality, uh, whether data of the right quality, yes or no. Uh, are those uh, values that we are receiving, are those really in the in the in the legal range or not? Uh, are we receiving, uh, you know, blood pressure which is uh, in the in the in in the uh, wide range or not so believe me there are places where we have seen data uh, we have received uh, only diastolic but no systolic something like that is this is this happening to my data yes or no uh, other than quality the next thing comes up is uh, you know storing uh, the, the same structured and unstructured data in the in the same repository uh, if if we are going with the traditional ways we may not be able to do that so uh, you would store your files on file system somewhere and maybe your data that is parsed data in some DBS format somewhere else and then you need to try, trace it back and tie them back together. Uh, that becomes a big challenge. Uh, the, the, the third and fourth things are more towards uh, you know, transformation and uh, reconciliation uh, challenges. Uh, I kind of spoke about it. Uh, it. Those are dependent on my uh, you know, downstream systems, and my downstream system more or less uh, you know, keep telling me this is the kind of data I need. And uh, do I need to do different kind of uh, transformation for different things? Uh, and the sources as well are sending me different types of data. So again, transformation and reconciliation keeps giving me a lot of trouble. Uh, the last one is uh, you know data delivery wherein how do I create the views how do I create my output apis depending upon the kind of uh, source systems and the downstream uh, you know applications I'm sharing my data with uh, and and end usage of the data 
so is it is it the quality management is it care management advanced analytics everybody has their own uh, you know different different ways of looking at data uh, maybe my head is and quality management would require data which is uh, you know just the parsed and curated and uh, you know process thoroughly uh, but maybe my advanced analytics people or maybe my data scientist people uh, they might need a, a data which is de identified and now that brings in another you know animal in the in the room uh, that whatever uh, you know work so far you have done now you need to get a de identified uh, portion of it and give it to this uh, data science uh, analytics guys and while doing that you you still have to maintain uh, the parity of the data so it it cannot happen that i have a patient has 10 records and when we give it to the data scientist, those ten records of parity is missing. Uh, one needs to uh, take care of these these things as well, and all of these are the challenges uh, that 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 we have seen in past and even continue to see today. Yeah, and Swarn, as as you think about that, maybe if you can comment a little bit on the creation of sandboxes for different stakeholders, whether it's a system or a person or a group. Uh, that wants to play with that data and whether that sandbox is blinded uh, or has PHI associated with it? Yeah, so there are there are uh, two, three things that uh, that a sandbox can do and uh, needs to be doing. So one is uh, uh, you don't want to give entire data in your data lake or in your entire repository to data scientists because you might be having terabytes of data. So you want to do uh, a slice of the data and give it to them. And the sizes could be a vertical slice or a horizontal slice, uh, because uh, maybe I'm I, as a data scientist, I'm looking at a certain aspect of my data, certain attributes and certain uh, uh, entities. I, I'm interested in a vertical slice. I don't need all the entities. Uh, but even in that, uh, I may not be you know looking at all the data uh, because of the sheer size or maybe because of the geography that I'm interested in. And in that case, the horizontal slice comes into picture. Uh, once, if if I am uh, you know uh, sourcing this uh, data science job to external party, then I create this sandbox uh, with a de-identified data and send it to them. Uh, but if those guys are probably internal, uh, I can I can might as well you know use it uh, identified data a lot. Uh, what 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 the data scientist guys can do more to it is once we give them the sandbox. Uh, they may want uh, it to be refreshed daily or they may want it to be refreshed weekly and all these things needs to happen in automated fashion uh, they may want to upload certain data into the sandbox uh, without touching my bigger repository uh, the, uh, you know some sort of uh, uh, benchmarking data or so against which they want to compare their algorithms uh, they need to be you know able to do that and maybe there are two data scientists which are working uh, in, in in tandem with each other and then, uh, yes, I as one data scientist, I create my sandbox, and I may want to share my sandbox with uh, with uh, uh, you know Jeff or so. And, and yes, uh, I, I should be able to manage uh, my sandbox. So once the sandbox is created uh, for for a data scientist, then the entire management of data and uh, you know rights management, uh, we believe, needs to be done by that particular data scientist. Yep. And so as we as we think about that question, let's look at our poll results here. So. The results from our uh, first poll have 30% of the respondents saying they do have a single source for their clinical data, 70% saying no, they don't. And for the scenario that Swarin just talked about, dynamically creating different views for different downstream, whether it's systems like a HEDA system or risk contracts so on and so forth, or for users like data scientists, these kind of requirements are gonna be variable and um, uh, timely as well. And so as you think about what your strategy is moving uh, towards this for the 70%, I think will impor be important for the 30%, making sure you're meeting all those different requirements. So as we move on to our next polling question, the question is how many clinical formats of data uh, uh, do you collect? And so I'll launch that poll question uh, there, everybody should see it on their screen as we move on to the next area of the architecture. And so, as Warren reviewed the high-level architecture, now we'll go into some of the details of what does this mean uh, as we look more more towards executing that architecture. So, I just want to over over to you again. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. So, uh, what we had done is. Uh, 
who we were trying to overlay uh, an implementable architecture uh, on the conceptual architecture that we saw uh, on, on the previous slide. Uh, in terms of uh, the first layer, uh, in terms of getting data uh, from various places and then uh, you know storing it to uh, to the raw format is, is the first thing that we would do. Uh, there could be various ways to get data into into uh, you know your data lake. Uh, you could have ETL platforms. If if your uh, sources are database sources, you can get it from them and push it to your uh, you know raw data store uh, part of your data lake. The, the next one could be interface engines. If uh, that's uh, that's the one which is you know pretty much uh, you know a standard in in healthcare industry, uh, you may have interface engine, be it Merth or Ensemble or Rhapsody of the World. Uh, you would be connecting to EHR, uh, maybe HIEs, and getting data from various places. And most of the cases, uh, you would be getting HL7 currently as we speak. Uh, there are places where we have seen you know uh, data coming in uh, CCDAs and. Uh, even uh, FHR nowadays, but uh, still the HL7 is pretty much dominant out here. And the third one is streaming adapter. That's that's a new one that has come up, right? Uh, you have got your variables and uh, various websites, and you keep getting data uh, on, a, on a continuous streaming basis. And all of them uh, will then converge into uh, what we call as a raw data store. Uh, the raw data store, uh, the way we have imagined is, uh, it, it's, a, it's a place where we'll store uh, all our internal and external data. And while we are storing it here, if you would notice uh, the names of the boxes in the raw data store, uh, they are probably kind of mimicking the names of the source systems. So the affinity of the source uh, from where the data has been received uh, is is clearly maintained when the raw data store, uh, you know, part of the data lake is is designed. Uh, it is it is more of a mimicking of whatever we have received from the source and uh, also maintain the affinity towards it. I know that this record has come from this particular source at this point in time and so on and so forth. So that, that's the first layer, uh, more of uh, acquisition, and then once you get in, uh, you know, push it to the push it to the storage pattern, which is the first storage that is the raw. Uh, yep, can and so as we, it. yeah, so let, let's just look at the poll results because the poll was around how many different formats of data uh, are you collecting? And we see here 19% um, are collecting just 1 to 5, 38% 5 to 10, and then 43%, the largest group of respondents, collecting 10 or more. And if we overlay the concept of collecting this number of feeds with the concept of not having a single source, so you're collecting this number of feeds, but it's only use, useful for a single downstream system, that makes it expensive in terms of how do you manage it and how do you manage it multiple times and for multiple systems. But this also gets to the world where we're seeing people needing to collect now multiple sources of that data for uh, different initiatives. And so the tide has already turned from collecting everything just on uh, uh, claims data, that administrative data, to now needing that other data in order to supplement it and to get better scores, to get better visibility, to get uh, better outcomes. So that back over to you, Swarn. Okay. Uh, the next one is the uh, is the data access layer. So we we are we'll come to the processing engine uh, in a, in a minute, but. Uh, the next one is data access layer. It's it's more of uh, you know the different parts of storage, just uh, the enterprise data lake. Uh, this is the one where uh, data that you have received in st uh, raw storage, uh, you would parse and you will uh, you know keep it in the internal format of it. So e e even out here, if you see uh, the names are still repeating the EHR, uh, the HI uh, health plan labs and uh, you know medical groups. Uh, that's because the way we have imagined it, and this is the place where we'll still maintain the source affinity. Uh, there are reasons to it, and I'll come to that. So uh, there are places uh, where we have seen, uh, you know, my customers asking us that they want to run data quality checks uh, on the raw data that they have received or on the data that they have received itself. And that's the reason why, uh, you know, we are keeping this, uh, you know, the, 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 the data lake part, uh, still keeping the, the source affinity around. Uh, you want to do standardization of the data. So some sources send you maybe, you know, uh, so rather they do not send you lying and you want to make them lying. 
maybe some sources send you totally local kind of a coding system for all your uh, medications and you want to you know translate them to the standard medications maybe uh, ndc if we have to do hedis reporting on top of it or maybe you know there are plethora of other quality checks that you want to perform and you want to do source wise analysis after the data is passed uh, you want to know that which source is giving you right quality data which source is giving you no more of more and more grief in terms of uh, what sort of a data quality issues uh, that the source is sending you and that's the reason why we are imagining that uh, after the parsing we still retain the source affinity the next layer of storage is the operational data store or the common data model as we like to call it and that's where uh, we do the transformation and the reconciliation of the data across uh, all these sources that we have and we form a data store and that could be clinical data store uh, that could be operational data store that could be financial that could be utilization and what not uh, depending upon the kind of data i have to uh, you know provision for my uh, downstream systems uh, different kind of uh, data uh, data quality i thought not data quality, but the data uh, storage and the data uh, model can be can be deployed here and this is where uh, you know jeff talked about the analytics workspace that's basically the sandbox that we talked about uh, the next one is uh, this is the heart and the crux of the whole thing that we have been talking so far so uh, we call it uh, you know the life cycle management here we call it clinical data ingestion pipeline a pipeline is the one which uh, you know keeps on uh, acting on the data uh, by virtue of calling different different components uh, at different point in time the first things are a plethora of parsers and going back to uh, you know jeff's point uh, multiple types of data that we receive multiple formats of data that we receive uh, we need a lot many parsers around uh, once the data is parsed then the next thing is to do uh, check for data quality uh, whether the data is the right quality yes or no and then comes the standardization uh, then comes reconciliation you want to uh, ensure that uh, you, know, you are forming single source of truth for for yourself uh, the patient's demography coming from ehr and patient demography probably coming from uh, maybe another pms system which one do you trust do you trust pms or do you trust ehr uh, all these kind of uh, you know questions are answered out here in the reconciliation piece the next one is the transformation that is uh, from the structure that you have received data uh, and where you want to store it could be completely different uh, maybe you are receiving a single big line in which you have patients uh, you know name address gender date of birth everything and maybe three or four different addresses uh, but the way you are storing it is uh, you have a separate uh, table for storing your addresses so out there what's going to happen is that one single uh, row that you have received would get split into multiple rows and across multiple entities uh, and next is uh, empi empi is something which uh, you know allows you to uh, we, we all know it it will allow me to match my patients match my members across multiple uh, sources that i receive and and the last one is the identification uh, we we kind of talked about it a uh, lot much uh, you know uh, use use for sharing data for, in in a meaningful fashion uh, but uh, at the same time hiding the phi information and uh, you know making it less risky to be shared across so this is the part where we imagine is going to be uh, the the crux of it and and uh, and what we call it as a pipeline one after the other all the components keep keep coming up uh the, the 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 biggest thing that we need to uh, you know keep into keep in our mind while designing this is uh we need to of course create a modular architecture so if if uh, my customer tells me that uh, i have solved my data acquisition problem because i i have my uh, you know parser that i i have got from somewhere and can your uh, you know pipeline starting from quality to the identification can take up or is it that if i am if i have to come to you then uh, should i be using your parser only uh, that's the that that should not be the case uh, that's what we believe because uh, any any pipeline should have components which are loosely coupled uh, they should talk to each other uh, you know uh, using what we call as a data dictionary uh, every every component has a, has a source and uh, and a target so it knows that this is a data dictionary by which i am going to read data and this is a data dictionary by which i am going to spit out the data so even if they are developed uh, under a single umbrella of a data uh, you know pipeline uh, we still recommend that uh, they should be talking to each other as if they are talking to a different component uh, so that they are loosely coupled 
and you can uh, you know almost play around with them like a lego boxes uh, these two parsers i want to do quality standardization reconciliation but i don't want to do empi i want to directly go into data identification yes you should be able to do that uh, that's that's uh, you know that's it uh, the way we we have been imagining uh, the data pipeline should be and at the same time data governance need, uh, should not be you know sidelined uh, auditing security lineage of the record coming from your file all the way to operation data store uh, you should be able to track and that's that's all the features that uh, we believe that in uh, a clinical data ingestion pipeline should be should be having yep so Swarn, as we look at this picture all together now that you described what would you say are some of the key things as people think about either getting started with this or if they've already started their journey, how do they think about this? Because this is a, a, a big picture and this is a big strategy. What are your thoughts uh, in terms of how do they take that one step at a time uh, so that they can get business value uh, out of the solution? So what i have seen is uh, following so they they usually uh, you know typically start with a with a vertical slice some of the customers because they want to feed uh, one of the sources data to to one of their downstream so they would pick up one source and then they would go uh, in the in the parsing mode and then after the parsing they would turn data quality uh, standardization reconciliation in this case uh, you know doesn't really come uh, too much into picture because we are talking of one single source and that's where they get a quick win they can directly go into uh, bypassing reconciliation they can directly go into uh, you know data, operational data store uh, that would be a quick win for them uh, but there are other customers where uh, you know uh, they are more from a uh, old school technology they say they believe in having uh, a data layer at a time so out, out there it is a little bit uh, uh, you know lengthy process but yes that that's the best way to do it and uh, that's that's where uh, you know the uh, the the decision making has to come in whether you want to have certain quick wins and you know start a stream of your business end to end or you want to you know uh, look at the platform as a whole and then start building platform layer by layer and then uh, you know we, you you give your uh, downstream system the the whole whole bunch of the data that you have. Okay. So as we uh, move forward here, another polling question. Are you able to leverage your clinical data as standard supplemental? So with the change in regulations, there's now oversight in terms of running through your clinical data through a certified solution to create standard supplemental. And so we'll, we'll launch this poll here um, and let everybody uh, start to go ahead and answer that as we as we move on. So, what's our perspective then on steps to migrate to a modern uh, clinical data strategy? <clears throat> as we talk to uh, people who play the chief data officer, the CDO, they often have a dilemma. So, their dilemma is the long-term strategy. You saw the picture that we showed that picture, you know, every organization will have their version of the ideal picture, but that picture is not a simple picture. It's got a lot of pieces. You got to pull those pieces together. You got a lot of pull a lot of data sources together, create consistency in that approach. At the same time, you have business leaders coming to you saying, oh, I need to get this done. I want to integrate this application. I want to pull this data source in. I need it fast. Uh, I need it now. And these two things often create contradictions in terms of how do you execute on this. So short-term goals lead to one-offs, lead to point-to-point -point integrations, and the long-term uh, gets compromised. And so the question is, how do you leverage short-term on the way uh, on the way to long-term? As we think about this, we'll go back uh, to our polling question here and look at the answers. So here, uh, this is actually some good news. Um, people are able, um, two thirds uh, of folks are able to leverage their clinical data as standard supplemental. Um, and with the new regulations, um, uh, that's great news for uh, people who are, are starting to look at this. Um, and I know that auditors have taken exceptions to 
uh, some of the rules. So, you know, some of our customers who have been consuming CCDA uh, into their HEDIS or risk solutions have gotten um, uh, exceptions from auditors to include that and other types of clinical data. Um, but the message from NCQA is that you have to, going forward, start to leverage these standard uh, solutions for creating standard supplemental data. Um, but this is good news from this audience. So as we move forward from our chief data officer's dilemma, uh, we have another polling question. Um, uh, do you have on your roadmap, so for the 70% uh, of folks who don't have a single source, do you have it on your roadmap to leverage clinical data across your enterprise for a single purpose, i.e. HEDIS, HCC contracts, for all quality programs alone or for all programs? What, what is the driver of your initiative? And we'll launch that poll as we go, uh, as we go to the next slide here. So coming back to my chief data officer's dilemma, what we see is our customers taking one bite at a time. So being able to execute on that business initiative, that business owner comes to you and says, hey, I need to integrate this, I need to do it fast. We'll call that the foundation. And as uh, Swanen talked about, hey, let me take a single source of data and feed that in uh, to the application reconciliation transformation uh, of that uh, to manage that single source. But as you then build that foundation for the next project or the next two projects or the next five projects, how do you build on top of that? Rather than having that one be point to point solution, have it be the foundation where you can then enrich that and then the next time you're enhancing it and then you're getting to a more mature solution that represents the total picture um, that's out there. And so this is what we're seeing really solve that chief data officer's dilemma of I've got individual initiatives, I've got individual business owners that I have to satisfy, but then I also have organizational goals that I have to look at. Juan, what's your what's your thought on approaches that our customers have taken as they build their journey uh, towards clinical data integration? Okay, so what we have seen is uh, the 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 way it is laid out here, Gary, the foundational enrichment and enhancement. Uh, what do you call foundations for one customer may not be the same for the other one. It depends on uh, you know the way they want to do it. Uh, this is one representation of what the foundational entities and what enrichment could be. Uh, there are other places, as I spoke about, uh, as I spoke about it one earlier, correct? Uh, one customer is going for the uh, layer by layer uh, architecture, and in that case, uh, reconciliation, transformation, uh, clinical data, and uh, all those good stuff come little later. Uh, the first is only the acquisition part, and then only the standardization and the quality part, that's what they bring in. Uh, once they they have the entire this, uh, standardized data coming in, uh, then they go for the next layer and layer. So what is your foundations and what do you treat as your uh, you know enrichment? It's something that depends on, on the path that you choose. Uh, the, the customer who was working more from a uh, you know horizontal slice kind of a perspective to to make certain things ready for their uh, uh, downstream system quickly uh, they are the guys who would probably follow the the path that we have laid out here uh, look at you know ingestion and reconciliation and transformation first uh, make something ready for the downstream and then get into standardization and quality and then get into you know matching and sandbox and de-identification for your data scientists and then the final goal is obviously uh, the lineage and streaming if you are getting and data governance part. So there are two, two places that I, have, I am currently working with both of them and uh, they both are having exactly the different way of thinking about their uh, you know, foundations and their enrichment and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So let's now let's look at the poll question uh, that we had here. In terms of folks' roadmaps, what we're seeing is fairly close between using it for a single source, 35%, uh, versus using it for all quality programs at 41%, and then a smaller group who are using it and leveraging 
really across the organization. If I think about that 24%, it's pretty close to the 30% uh, from the original answer of do they have a single um, system that manages all their clinical uh, data. And so I'm assuming that 24% is probably fairly close to the same folks who answered that original question on uh, do they have a cross-enterprise data strategy. But it's good to see that some of the others are looking at leveraging their clinical data for all their programs, uh, not just a single program, because uh, that creates efficiencies across your organization. So that will go to the next slide. Warren, back over to you. Yeah, so this is where uh, actually ties back to what I said a little bit earlier and looking at, uh, you know, those two cases. And the, the first thing is, uh, you know, you have to understand your CDS strategy. Uh, what are your, uh, you know, strategy goals? What are your short-term wins that you want to go for? Or you want uh, looking at uh, you know, the long-term uh, goals and uh, you want to go it more by layer by layer. So first is uh, you have to analyze what you want to do uh, in, in at what point in time you want to have your wins and uh, you know first is to strat strategize according to that uh, then is to develop a response here roadmap wherein uh, you would figure out okay th at this point in time i will have this part uh, ready at uh, you know uh, just just exactly the you know, last slide when we had those foundational and uh, enrichment and you know final roadmap so that's that's the next step that's the next step that you would do uh, you would talk about all of that, uh, the, the roadmap that you have, you would get, uh, you know, buy-in from various key stakeholders uh, who are going to use the data, who are your, uh, you know, sponsors and stuff like that. Uh, and then uh, is a time that you would, you would implement your holistic, uh, you know, solution, which is going to fit almost all the requirements that you have uh, in terms of, uh, you know, forming a data repository and forming the single source of truth for your uh, organization. And the last one, uh, and not the least, is uh, manage change impact. Uh, once when you have developed a uh, you know, project plan, uh, it could be a year long or maybe a year and a half long or maybe six months long. Uh, but what might happen is you have a year and a half long plan, and then uh, six months down the line or eight months down the line, there are certain changes that come from regulatory perspective. And well, you, you need to manage that. So that, that is something which uh, you know keeps denting your, uh, the, the, the plan that you have done and uh, you know the roadmap that you have come across with, but this is this is the execution strategy that I still believe uh, one one would really go for. Uh, Jeff, any thoughts from your side? Yeah, no, I I think that that's uh, a good approach because what you, what's going to happen here is everybody has some existing assets, so understanding your CDI strategy shouldn't be necessarily rip and replace. It's leverage what you have to build out that roadmap. And as you're implementing a solution, build the components that are both quick wins and paths towards uh, towards that long term uh, towards that long term strategy. So I think you hit the nail on the head with taking this from an organizational perspective and really build that out and get everybody on the same page and then making sure you understand both your short term and your long term as you're executing on this. I think that's uh, very good advice. So as we uh, think about this and talking about long-term, we have a, a fun question on long-term. Have you thought about expanding your clinical data strategy for new initiatives? And so thinking out really long-term, we see a world where genomics will be more and more important. Um, so have you thought about including something like genomics? Is your current platform able to uh, be leveraged for something like genomics, which is a whole new type of data, a whole new scale of data, um, and a whole new set of questions that can be answered. So as while you're answering this, we'll go to some of our key takeaways and then we'll look at your question. So as we think about how do you execute on a clinical data strategy, it's really not just about technology. Technology is clearly important. Um, but it's people and process as well. And from a process perspective, as Warren talked about, build the roadmap. Understand where the business groups that are going to need uh, data for individual initiatives are coming from. Map out how do you build their solutions versus that long-term roadmap. This is possible. 
in the world of technology that exists today. And if you map that out, you can create both quick wins and the plan towards long term. In addition, looking at governance. So governance is incredibly important in the world of healthcare. The same concept can mean very different things to very different people. Um, and you want to make sure you understand that governance. Also, you will get the question multiple times of that data doesn't look right. That data doesn't look like it represents my population, my patients, my outcomes. Being able to see where it came from is incredibly important. From a people perspective, stakeholder buy-in. Um, so uh, you need the buy-in of those business uh, stakeholders uh, to use this system. The temptation is, oh, my my requirements are different. My requirements uh, are outside of uh, the system. I can take my uh, my dollars for the budget for this and just use them separately. Um, that creates silo data counterproductive results, so not just from the technology organization's perspective, but the business owners themselves have had to go to multiple systems to see what's going on with that with that member or with that provider. Um, in addition, outreach, communication, uh, then also gets siloed and abrasion happens. And the technology uh, piece we, we talked about, but having a modular approach is really an important thing here. Um, don't try to bite off everything all at once because um, that's a recipe of failure. Systems from five years ago took two, three years to stand up, and the business typically gave up on, on those initiatives. In the world of technology today, you're able to uh, go end-to-end -end and get quick wins in three, four, six months, same time as it would take normally to implement uh, those business solutions. So you're not talking about a lag in time, um, but you have to uh, take a modular approach around that. So with that, we'll take a look at our last uh, polling question um, and uh, see what the results are. And here, this one actually, uh, of all the answers, surprises me the most, that 57% of folks have already started thinking uh, about new initiatives and, and how do new initiatives fit into those. And maybe not genomics explicitly, but from a new initiatives perspective, 57% uh, percent of folks are already planning uh, planning for what the future will come. And in healthcare, the only thing that I'm truly certain of is that there will be something new tomorrow. Uh, welcome uh, to the world of government. They'll always be introducing something new or business models or initiatives or things like that. Um, so this is good news here that people are focused not just on today, but on tomorrow. Um, so with that, that, uh, that concludes the slides portion of this. We'll now take questions, and I think that there are uh, the capability uh, for you to ask questions um, on your uh, on your desktop there. Um, while we were doing the webinar, it looks like um, uh, some of the questions have already come in, um, and so we'll we'll take those. But if people want to ask more questions, uh, we have uh, about seven minutes left. We'll take a few questions here. Um, so Swarn, I'll I'll ask this question to you. Um, the question is, what type of downstream requirements will be satisfied after the clinical data integration is done? Uh, just about uh, you know stuff that a pair would require in, in terms of uh, fulfilling probably the first one could be HIDIS. Uh, you, you, you simply add on uh, you know supplementary data to your uh, your administrative data that you have received, and uh, if you have a HIDIS engine, which is your biggest downstream, or your submission engine, uh, that's the first one. Uh, the other thing could be care coordination, and uh, maybe if you want to run population health management, you want to see, uh, you know, what are my uh, what what my population is going to look like, and you want to you know take certain cases about your population, run them through some sort of a wellness programs. Uh, you can do that because now you are also getting your lab data and other items correct. Uh, which will fit into all of that. So this 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 could be just about these things. Uh, one more thing could be your uh, you know data scientist guys. Uh, they want to run some sort of uh, algorithms of their own and to figure out yes this patient has come in today. Uh, what is uh, you know uh, probability that he is going to be sticking around in hospital for two days, two and a half days, uh, some sort of. Uh, uh, length of uh, you know, uh, length of stay kind of a calculation. If you want to do that, uh, those kind of uh, 
algorithm training purpose you can use it because now you have not only clinical data you also have your uh, you know astral claims data and you now have a longitudinal record of the patient mhm yeah so let me let me I'll ask my own personal follow up question to that this is not the question that came in but as you think about what you just talked about if there's a new business initiative that comes in could you leverage this data for that business initiative as well so um you know what you know today but there's going to be new requirements tomorrow can you leverage that existing data strategy for new systems new integration new purposes tomorrow and how would that work so from a strategy perspective if you ask me uh, unless you have to there are two two parts to it one is that uh, if you have to get again a new type of data uh then you will have to you'll have to go back to your sources get that new data into your stuff but then now you have your modules uh, kind of carved out uh, you know where the parser fits in you know where the data quality comes in and you know that these guys are loosely coupled so that that should uh, not be a problem but of course it's going to be uh, a, a journey where you have to go back all the way to the source and get the data uh, but if the new new system correct needs data which is already available in our data lake uh but maybe for whatever reason we haven't uh, you know transformed that data into into my common data model because it was not needed earlier now this is where uh, the data lake uh, you know the real power comes up uh, you can always uh, pick up data from raw and push it uh, forward to your uh, you know the new transformed uh, and the new data common data model and of course if it is ready in common data model then then that's it uh, you simply simply make it available to to your source to your uh, downstream systems Great. So I think we have time for one more question here. Um, pick one here. Uh, all right. So, what are the different types of healthcare sources uh, which your solution can integrate the data from? Uh, I think we we kind of uh, you know talked about it a little bit, but yes, a, a, any source uh, which uh, kind of gives us uh, standard, uh, you know. formats be it hl7 be it uh, x12 be it uh, fhr or you know any other standard one like qrd ccd uh, those those can be handled easily uh, because once you are written this uh, parsers correct uh, what's going to happen is uh, the standard field anybody gives you your parsers are not going to change much uh, if somebody uh, you know gives you standard field but uh, little bit change field uh, you may have to change the parsers little bit uh the next thing is uh, people giving you uh, you know uh, custom feeds and most of the places i have seen custom feeds are being csvs uh csvs are the one which are uh, i have found you know pretty easy to map it out you just give me next one more csv what happens is i have to just map it to a different uh, uh, you know uh, using my uh, different transformation logic but my transformation logic doesn't become all that difficult because uh, my my csvs uh those are so so easy to work with of course those are non standard but uh, there are sources which give me that kind of a thing uh, other could be you know uh, structure xml uh, we can always deal with this uh, what can be another thing is probably uh, you know i can think of is a dicom uh, we would not be proce- probably processing the the image but yes dicom headers we can definitely read uh, and and you know get that data into into the common data model so all all these things mm-hmm. that we can we can process yeah and so the dicom comment makes me think of what about unstructured or semi structured data how would you manage those how can you think about those so uh semi structured is basically i mean i i call it as uh, semi structured that is uh, if if somebody gives you a xml or maybe somebody gives you a data which you can parse into something uh once we parse it we can structure but there is one more thing that is like notes or so and if you have notes uh, how do you how do you deal with it because the notes have contain your diagnosis or notes contain that go do this procedure uh, that's where probably nlp kind of a solution needs to be is to bring in uh but if you have to really work on uh, pda for images uh, that's where uh, a sophisticated ocr kind of a uh, you know a model has to be plugged in uh you you get all the pdf into it and then you run it through ocr modules or so or maybe the image uh, or run it through ocr model and that will give you uh, uh 
uh, directly give a text, and then probably NLP will work on the text and give you, uh, you know, data in a structured format. But this is what I, I, I really feel it can be done. Okay. So um, with that, we'll uh, wrap up our webinar. Uh, we're right at the top of the hour. Thanks for everybody for listening today, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And Swarn, uh, thanks to you as well for a very informative educational webinar. Yeah, thanks a lot, everybody, and uh, you know, thanks for being patient with me. All right, and thank you both for the great presentation and for sharing your thoughts today. Thank you to the audience for participating in today's conference. That concludes this webinar, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.